I'm Don Summer, the director of Prison Mission Association. PMA was founded in 1955 by Joe Mason. Brother Joel was a remarkable person, and his extraordinary life impacted countless individuals during his many years of service to the Lord. The following interviews tell the story of Joe Mason by those who knew him best, his family, friends, and co-workers in the ministry. The purpose of this tribute to Joe is not to praise or acclaim him as a man, as he would never have approved of such a thing. Rather, this presentation has been put together to record the legacy of a person that was sold out to God and to inspire others to follow in his footsteps. Joe Ben Mason was born in 1910 in Texahoma, Texas. Although raised by a godly mother, he strayed away from the church in his younger years. However, in 1933, while riding the rails during the Depression, he met the Lord through an evangelist in California. He worked as an insurance adjuster for many years, and he and his first wife, Helen, and their children lived in a number of locations. His daughter, Linda, tragically died from polio in the early 50s. Grief-stricken, he and Helen and Larry moved to Weatherford, Texas, and he began a ministry of visiting county jails in that part of Texas. In 1955, he was led to begin Prison Mission Association. Later, he moved the ministry to Phoenix, Arizona, and then to Riverside, California. Helen passed away from cancer, and in 1972, Joe married his second wife, Ada, who served the Lord along with him for the rest As of his life. As most of you know, in 1955, after my sister died, uh, uh, we started, uh, we moved to Texas, and we started making the, he, he uh, felt called to go to the, uh, county jails. Well, he started a little butterfly route around our town, and uh, on one Sunday we'd make this little route, go around, hit, I don't know how many, you know, uh, four or five, however many little towns he could get to, four or five county jails. Evangelism, and yet he, he was being asked questions that he couldn't answer. He had no answer for these questions. And uh, one day uh, he was driving to a prison, I believe, to uh, for some meetings and a gentleman was riding with him and they were in Mineral Wells, Texas. And they were driving down the street and the gentleman had to point out this church in Mineral Wells and he said, this, this church is really a strange church uh, but uh, the pastor there really knows the Bible. And uh, it was a gentleman by the name of Charles Wages, or no, not Charles Wages, um, uh, R.B. Shifflin. And uh, so I think it was the next week Joe and his wife went and uh, uh, R.B. was preaching on the Great Commission. And uh, from that time on he was uh, just enthralled with the, 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 the grace message and how it could answer the questions of these prisoners uh, regarding uh, many of the issues that he, he didn't understand at that point. Sunday morning we were in a very small building, one of our first buildings. and. Uh, he and his wife and son walked in and uh, during the adult Bible class and I was teaching on Mark 16 and why that is not our commission and why that we don't see the genuine signs following and uh, this got his attention immediately and uh, when the class was over he came up very excited and he said now brother I'm not accepting this without studying it but he said Man, this sounds good. Said if this is correct, this is the answer to a lot of uh, of error. After Helen passed away, I never did have a chance to say anything to Joe. I, I mean, I didn't send a card or anything. I don't know why I didn't because I knew them. But uh, Joe came through on a trip to Michigan. He was on a trip to to speak, I think, at the college, maybe some other places. He came through. Phoenix, and I remember uh, speaking to him and, you know, saying how sorry I was to hear about Helen. And that was about all. After Joe left, apparently he decided he, needed, he, decided he had an interest in me, and uh, he started writing me letters. And uh, I don't think I got any phone calls, but I got letters, and they started coming fast and furious. And he well, he was a happy-go-lucky guy. That's that's the first thing I need to say. He was, he, you know, in a full of energy. I, I remember I would walk on a yard and I would meet Joe and say, Hey, Minna, I got good news. <laughs> what is it? The Lord is coming soon. 
<laughs> Joe was uh, always smiling. Ever si From that day on, I never saw Joe with a, a frown on his face. You know, um, several things. Just the minute that you meet him, Joe um, is a positive. He is, you can sense just he's a man of God. And I just really appreciated that. Um, I I know he always was um, desirous of people being saved. He had a tract always uh, laid out before everybody, every place we went, um, he passed out a tract. <laughs> <laughs> Gregarious. He was uh, he was a dynamic person to be around. Loved the Lord. Was very clear in in presenting the gospel. Believed in people. Oh, it was bubbly, uh, as best I can say. Uh, <laughs> he uh, he just uh, was so happy uh, all the time. Well, Joel never met a stranger. He had a he had an outgoing personality. Joe's personality was he have never ever met a stranger. Um, he would uh, immediately strike up a conversation with anybody, and if he walked to somebody on the street and came up to him, the first thing he would ask him, it seems, was always, Hi, how are you doing? I just had a, a question I wanted to ask you. If uh, you died today, where would you be tomorrow? And uh, interested in everybody's salvation. He was, had a glowing personality, and he was very friendly, very outgoing. And he loved the Lord, and he loved the work of the Lord, and he was a real testimony. He witnessed to many, many people outside of the prison, inside the prison, and he was always on fire for the Lord. Joe was an unusual person in this way that, first of all, I don't believe that Joe had an enemy in the world. Uh, when I met Joe, uh, he only wanted to talk about one subject. Now, the subject was our Lord. He wanted to be sure that I was born again, even though I was running a Christian radio station. But Joe had to find out. Very outgoing and uh, challenging. Uh, this is the thing that he presented his the ministry and the work and what the Lord was doing through uh, the prisoners that uh, made it uh, intriguing and, and uh, actually a, a desire that you'd like to help. Joe was a... Uh... Such an enthusiastic guy, and and and, uh, and uh, uh, just a magnetic personality. You just couldn't help but like Joe Mason. You meet Joe, and you're not the same. I mean, you know, you may not like him, or you may like him, but Joe, is, uh, in my view, shines forth Christ. So he caught my attention, because he is what you call, in my view, a joyous Christian. I mean, he stayed joyous. And so he did. Uh, so, so to me, that was one of the things that really stood out about him. He just loved people. He loved prisoners. He loved his ministry. And uh, he, he just seemingly not, wouldn't be discouraged by any action that these people would do or act on. Joe Mason was a, and a very unique individual, uh, tremendous uh, energy. A man who uh, had two primary burdens, I would, I would say, as far as his life was concerned. Or three, I guess, maybe I would say. One certainly was evangelism. One was to bring the gospel to men and women in prison. He started out in his, from his home uh, in Texas. I was, uh, my first impression of Brother Joe was, number one, he was a great guy to be around. He was just a joy. And uh, he obviously was uh, intensely... Uh, intensely desiring people to come to Christ. Very evangelistic and very loving in his evangelistic approach to people. And in addition to that, it, it, it was obviously his concern that people grow in Christ. He, he was... Uh, okay. uh, Joe, of course, is very bold in his witness. You, know, you could just rest assured that if you were out with him at a restaurant, that he would leave a generous tip and share the gospel with the waitress. Or if we were anywhere with, with Joe, he would... Uh, he was always very bold sharing the gospel. He had no fear. He had absolutely no fear of sharing the gospel with anybody. Um, uh, always, always had a track to hand to somebody, you know. Or, and uh, oh, hey, it just happened to have one of these left. He'd say, you know, <laughs> a track. And he said, a real oh. passion for first of all evangelism. Secondly, he was a man of prayer. That was one of the things that I really appreciated about the years that I was with Joe Mason was to uh, see his commitment to prayer. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first time we were driving along, we were headed toward a prison uh, for some meetings, and uh, Joe says, well, let's pray, you know, and he's driving the car, and I made sure that he didn't close his eyes. <laughs> but uh, it was an exciting thing to see under... He wanted to pray. 
Well, yeah, Joe was spontaneous. Joe, uh, he would sometimes scare you. We were um, had a board meeting, and we were all driving in Joe's car. I can't even remember where we were heading, but if you know anything about the freeways of Southern California, you want your hands on the wheels and your eyes on the road at all times. Well, out of the blue, Joe says, hey, you know, why don't we have a word of prayer? Well, he was driving. <laughs> My big concern was... Um, I'm not familiar with the concept of praying with our eyes open, but, you know, hopefully this is a good time. Well, he saw the concern on my face, and he says, no, I can pray with my eyes open. It's okay. And I said, boy, that is a really good thing. <laughs> he was a man of prayer. And I tell you, it was so incredible to pray with Joe, and we prayed all the time, you know. One of the things that I, I appreciate very much about Joe is if you came in to talk, if you had a problem, you definitely would have prayer right then. He never would say, I will pray for you sometime in the future if I remember to think about it. It was always, well, let's pray. Um, and he would have any number of people come in, and they could not be in there more than three minutes before he'd pray for them, pray with them. Um, that was one of the things. And also, I met him in the church there at the first time, and I was very much impressed with him that... Uh, I asked him to pray for something. He said, yes, we're going to pray right now. And he got on his knees and we prayed for it. And I've learned that ever since that when someone asks you to pray for something, yes, pray right now because you'll forget it later on. So if you gave him a prayer request, he stopped right then and there and said, well, why don't we just pray about it right now? Let's not wait. Uh, he realized the importance of time. Great results. And then the third, fourth, third thing was uh, certainly his commitment to the, to the grace message. Uh, this was very strong and goes all the way back to his early days as a Christian. It was just not, his, his ministry was not only evangelism of working with prisoners or evangelizing prisoners, but his ministry also was to teach these prisoners how to understand the Word of God. And that's why you have lessons. And then he would supplement those lessons with literature from Pastor Baker, Stam, and O'Hare, these guys, which was really strong dispensational teaching. Joe also was a man uh, very um, much uh, in love with the grace message and uh, boy he wanted to make that known throughout the world and and there wasn't um, a time hardly when we would meet with someone without him uh, letting them know that he loved the grace message and uh, preached from the polling perspective and that he was involved in a mission that was directly uh, helping people to understand the entire Bible in the light of Pauline truth. You couldn't, you couldn't hold anything against him because he, because he was being any kind of hypocrite or anything like that. You know, it was just what you saw with Brother Joe was what you got. You know, and and he was he practiced what he preached. Um, what really impressed me was his um, his real. Christian love for these guys in jail. You know, uh, I have to say that... I the patience, because as you know, dealing with prisoners and so forth, you have to work with them. They will fall in, by the wayside. But Joe always was there willing to pick them up and push them back into the ministry or push them only into the Christian life. Well, PMA was always interested in seeing... Um that the inmates uh, had an avenue other than the correctional system to write their lives and the most important one was obviously spiritual. Very quick to um, encourage me to do things that I had never done before. I mean I made a, we had some... Uh, realized that these people who were uh, uh, receiving the Lord and, uh, and trusting Christ needed to grow, and so that's where the Bible Correspondence Courses started. I guess it was exciting because we had, we had lessons from all over the country and in some cases from overseas. It was a lot of corresponding with prisoners, and as I was thinking about this, and um, one time, because I was writing about 200 letters a month that, are, that were just dictated and the secretary wrote, wrote them out. Um, I thought, I wonder how many 
Joe is doing. And, um, and I counted him up, and he was sending out about 600 letters a month to any number of people. They could be contacts in foreign countries. They could be, he would read something in a magazine, and they would be an address, and he would write them about God's grace. It could be a pastor that was anywhere in the United States or the world that he would just write. And if there was any question, if there was anything, he would just write. And so part of the ministry, at least a large part of it, was, was dealing with uh, corresponding with people in prison, out of prison, people that had nothing to do with prison. Uh, I'm sure that Joe wrote to people that were unsaved. He just had a tremendously large writing ministry. Well, I think that's probably one of the things that first impressed me when I went to serve in the office was uh, the idea that uh, a letter didn't sit there for longer than just a matter of minutes when it came to his attention. Uh, <laughs> he had one of these recliner, well, it tilted back office chair, and he'd stick his foot on the desk, and he would just dictate by the hour, and, and it was all personal. That's one of the things I really appreciated about him, because I could hear him dictating letters, and he would look at a letter or look at something, and he would zero in on something that he wanted to tell a person, and so the person... Uh, <clears throat> whenever we traveled or anything, I uh, he always had a little portable typewriter that he'd carry with him everywhere he went. That was probably the first thing he put in the car and the first thing he took out uh, was his typewriter. And many nights I went to sleep listening to him writing letters. And, uh, Joe lived, Joe lived the, the, the life of, of getting out the word. Uh, I mean, day and night at home, we, at home we had a typewriter and Joe even worked at, you know, at home writing letters. He had a passion for writing letters. I know that different works in other countries, that was when Lawrence's song came into the picture and no one knew him and Joe started communicating with him and, uh, and established a whole work there. Writing, and Joe was a prolific writer. He would be writing to uh, prisoners in prison, he'd be writing to people overseas, missionaries overseas. Um, he would be writing to just anybody that he could, and he helped them in those letters. Oh, you know, it's unbelievable the impact that the mission has had, and even listening, you know, and, and being real close to it a lot, and, and uh, uh, sometimes I didn't... Every day that these lessons were <laughs> presented to my brother that I had copied for him, was just like the Lord was right there with us. And I had never had this close relationship with my brother because um, I just, I, I can't say enough uh, for what these lessons can do for others. I don't know how, I, I don't remember offhand how these people in foreign countries got our name, but Joe had, we had quite a ministry to prisoners in, um, in Thailand prison in Thailand and uh, also I now we had a contact in South Africa and the contact in Cameroon West Africa and I don't remember how these contacts uh, how 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 we they got our name and how they knew that we had Bible studies somehow and I don't know exactly how this happened but uh, there was a contact made in Africa we uh, started corresponding with Lawrence's song and well, a name that probably a lot of people will remember is Lawrence of Song, uh, was probably at that time one of the main people that he was excited about the ministry that was going on. And uh, there were about four or five uh, new churches in Africa that uh, he was involved with. Um, we also were uh, getting increased invol uh, uh, enrollment from students in Africa as well as other parts of the con uh, world. And in particular, we had one gentleman in Cameroon who was who would visit prisons and uh, who th would uh, uh, do evangelism. Then he would provide the Bible courses, and he would send them to our office in California. Well, it took almost six months for that exchange to take place, and it wasn't practical. And so in 1972, I had the privilege of traveling to Cameroon to uh, investigate the possibility of opening an office for the Bible correspondence courses, which we did. And that ministry continued on uh, up until the present, actually. It's still ongoing. Joe, as you know, was a prolific writer. And he sent his lessons all over the world 
to nationals. In fact, I kept some of the stamps when people would write back just to kind of keep foreign stamps. And I've got stamps from all over the world that basically came from that time frame of corresponding or people corresponding with Joe. One of the most profound uh, impact of uh, overseas internationally is in the continent of Africa where uh, through the office and through the extension in Cameroon, uh, I know of at least uh, uh, th uh, three and possibly four major uh, missionary ministries that have grown out of the Bible Correspondence Ministry in Africa. And uh, other places there. So the South African ministry began through the literature and efforts of Joe Mason. And it's the same with uh, our ministry in Kenya. You know, through these correspondent courses and through contact with nationals, and then missionaries going to these countries and, and working with the nationals and developing a ministry through them. Came to know the grace message uh, through PMA uh, literature that, was, uh, that came to South Africa. Mm -hmm. Really testify today that the PMA lessons really brought uh, a solid foundation for that church down in Port Elizabeth. As I said, the ministry in South Africa, the ministry in Kenya, um, came about because of the literature, the grace literature that he sent along with, with the with the Bible lessons. You know, Mason was the one who started the work in Cameroon. He's the one who's really instrumental in getting us into Kenya, and also instrumental in getting us into South Africa. And I'm sure that other missionaries could testify the same thing. Uh, we immediately compiled the correspondence course for one year, and we started posting the letters out. And the lessons out right there in South Africa and we grew that church within one year to over 150 people and, but also in a lot of churches I have used these lessons many times in my Bible studies in the church that I planted in South Africa before I came to the US and they've been used very effectively keep it up and God bless you and may the next 50 years be as fruitful as it as the last 50 has been yeah. And he was doing it and just to hear people in the thousands, thousands of letters that he wrote and, and uh, just no way that you can put a, put any kind of a figure on something like that. There's, I don't know. Through life and people have, at, at least that's what I'm hearing, at the end of life they really look at relationships as a key. And Joe really developed relationships with just hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, well, one day soon we're all going to get around that throne in heaven and we're going to say, Joe, thank you, thank you for being so faithful.